everybody knows that we are consuming stories, that we are craving for stories, that we are meaning-making creatures, that we love meaning-making from stories. But what is actually going on uh, and in the depth, what is happening uh, in people's personal lives and why, why this? So that was the, the main research que question. Tell me about the, the story that you, you love so much. So that was the main question. And why you love it and where, where is a common result? And the replies where you saw some common ground in the yes, reply? Yes, yes, uh, I could actually. That was the first, uh, in, in, during 10 years I was doing uh, a, a, a research that was my dissertation about favorite movies. And from that I could see the result was that it was two dimensions that was dominating in this uh, research. That people, was dealing, people were dealing with their own self-image, their own self in an interplay between screen and, and themselves. That was the one dimension. And the other was actually films articulated ideas about society. So it was both a so-called political ideological dimension of engagement and also this deep personal dimension of engagement. Who am I? Am I like this character or not? How do I uh, look? Uh, is, am I uh, a little bit li like her or what is the difference? And the, the wish to be, it also that's, that's one really important thing that you are wishing to be something and you can dream about being a little more like Brad Pitt or, or uh, in, in Baby in Dirty Dancing, which was one of the, the main results in that interview, the young woman who wanted to be a little bit courageous like, like Baby in Dirty Dancing. The wishes between who you actually are and who you want to be. So it's, it's a laboratorium for yourself. So when they came and, and, and we had the, the film on, on the screen and they, then I asked, where is the scene that you like the most and you're most touched by? Okay, this is this moment here is what makes me shiver and what makes me cry and what makes me uh, completely engage. I love this scene. Okay, why? Tell, tell me. So, so that, that was the way it was put up uh, in, in this second project to, to dig deeper into this viewing experience of, of the story when, when things are deepened. Is it about themselves? That there is a try to um, improve their ego, I would say, or is it about their understanding of the world? They try to improve their understanding or try to understand better what is around them? Yeah, and, and that was actually the second surprise. The creative ways people were jumping from scenes to their personal life and I guess this is, I mean, if you're a scriptwriter or you produce stories, you have an idea what would happen. And then you, the, your story is, when you have written a story in, in words, it, it is adapted to, to a screen and then it's projected for an audience. And then what happens? What, what, what processes are going on? Uh, and I guess it's almost impossible to, to, to know what the audience will, will interpret and what they, how they will engage. Uh, and that was a surprise for me to, to talk about. And when they e explained their, their interpretation, um, and I, I must show you this, uh, one of the most telling examples is from the, the young woman I, I was uh, interviewed about Pulp Fiction. She picked this scene um, where the Bruce Willis character is just going to, to leave a shop. His, his enemy is actually tortured downstairs in the basement by two corrupt police who, who is torturing Marcellus Wallace, is, is the enemy guy, a, a black man with a gun trying to shoot him. And he's on the step of, he has managed to, to run away from the basement and now he can move out in freedom. But in this scene, he hears the screaming of his enemy, Marcellus Wallace, being raped by these male police guys. And he hesitates, going out in his own freedom 
or taking the risk helping Marcellus Wallace with also risking his own life. And these moments, she talks about, because this is a, a scene which makes her love the character very much. She, she tells me during this scene, the camera is actually lingering on, on Bruce Willis' character's face, quite static. And after some seconds, he turns around and decides to go. So that's the story. But she tells me exactly this, which is interesting because she sees a face and then she decides what he thinks. But the film is just showing, showing the face. But she says like this, you can see his consciousness kind of. It's exactly when he opens the door, he's about to leave, not going to stay, but he happens to hear and then you see how they are zooming in on his face. And by the way, the camera is not zooming. It's just static. But she believes it's zooming because she is zooming in on, on, the, on the face. Very fascinating. Meaning it's a, it's a key, that, that for screenwriters is, is key. I mean, key. To, to be able to, to generate the possibility for the viewer to feel that uh, we as a viewer see how that character thinks. Exactly. The idea of having access to the brain of, of the other character. Exactly. Exactly. And how do you put up that situation where, where the audience are so deeply engaged in, in what is going on? That's the, that's the miracle of, of, of uh, successful storytelling. You can see how it thinks and then he decides. She decides that he decides. Hell no, I'll beat the shit out of them. So that was the condensed moment of this, this uh, film experience of, for her. But it's also put into her, because she's, she's uh, living a life. That was the second surprise for me in that film. Why is she interested in such a strange uh, movie with, with, which is partly controversial and, and, and with the violence and all this humor? Many people felt awkward about it. But she liked it very much because she, she had this sense that even if it's a brutal film about uh, moral, uh, moral people with, with uh, different flaws, they, she still thinks they are moral. You mean amoral people? Well, amoral, yeah. no, immoral, oh, sorry, sorry, amoral, sorry. moral. Immoral, yeah, sorry. Uh, depends. Because you were, you, were you were saying it's a film, it's just out of the frame. You, you were saying it's a film with moral people that are still behaving in a moral way. I, so I didn't get it. That. Yes, um, I mean, they, they are violent, they kill people, but they, just, they have still moral boundaries. And, and that's mm -hmm. why uh, it, you could tell, talk about it that amoral or immoral. Anyway, um, if you only, because she said, if you only see the, the world is brutal and ruthless. If you, if you only see that, you don't see the small moments of moral acts. And that's why she loves the, this, this, the main characters, because they have, in their world, it is something, somewhat okay to fight and kill. She knows that, that they are killing people. But doing that, the raping in the basement is their moral line. You don't do that. So, so she loves the character, because even if he is very bad, he has a moral line and and that's and and uh, and that is what she is experiencing here she assess his she feels that no he's not a, just a boxer who kills people he has a moral sentiment and sh she loves him very much for that reason that that he has this uh, dimension in him um, so and together with that, the film in, in overall ways, um, she, she talks uh, about the film in this way. When I was 25, I had this good feeling for the movie because there are more people having chaotic lives. She had herself a chaotic lives. And I didn't know that, that uh, you could, if you had a chaotic life, you could relate to Pulp Fiction and get being helped by that movie. Uh, wow, could life be like this? It makes you feel less lonely on the planet to see things that many others seem to have experienced. You share something. And, and her 
overall sense in life, life is brutal, but it's also fun. And that's why she loves all this uh, strange humor, humoristic, bizarre humor and sarcasm in, in the, the, the movie, because she has all these dialogues. She also made a, a, a connection between the film and how she and her husband talked. They had this uh, absurd, sarcastic, morbid humor when they were sitting in the car and playing with each other. They, were, they, were, they had this, this humor. And that was also fun for me. Oh yes, people have this kind of mixture, strained mixtures, uh, and some films, they tap into this peculiar personal mixture that, that taps into very specific feelings of how it is to be a human being in, in life. So getting down to the details, it goes all the way from the details in the scene to the overall uh, appreciation of the story and, and her own feeling of life. How did you use this kind of example to build a more general model of what people are doing yeah. uh, when they watch a film <clears throat> internally and also uh, yes. together? And I did that because collecting several stories of that kind, uh, I, I managed to, to contribute with new insights of what is going on in the viewer. Um, because here we have, I mean, there, there's a lot of writing of, of film, how film puts, uh, gives an input to the viewer, and the viewer creates meaning. Um, what I did, it was two things, because I combined and separated between basic emotions, and, and uh, which could be called affects, joy, curiosity, um, fear, disgust, and, and more of that, um, and also cognitions, high cognition, when you combine basic feelings with, with, with thinking about this, giving them direction and content, something happens which is specific for storytelling that you actually are, are emotionally in a, with your affect, you're engaged. Mm. But also it, 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 it deals with something, a conflict or, the, or a dilemma or something like that. And then you have this emotional evaluation where you as a viewer and this is an interesting, when, when every viewer is creating a, a story or a fabula, and every scriptwriter has a fabula and story to, to tell, but there is not a 100% match between the story that the scriptwriter or the, the director wants to tell and the, the, the viewer. The viewer is free to, to, to construct his or her own fabula, which I think is extremely important. The, the freedom of creating the fabula and then I could, through this and other examples, see that some people, they were engaged in actually understanding the story in a, in a basic way. <laughs> but the most interesting thing was when people were sitting in the movie, um, contempl contemplating, enjoying the films, sometimes and quite often they made this jump from the screen, from the story to their real life. The, the interplay between story and their own lives. And then I could see that when that happened, not always, maybe quite rare, but still sometimes, when that happens, people are dealing with very personal things, dreams, what they want to, to fulfill in life, conflicts they have, also, what I mentioned, the self-image nego negotiations, who am I, who, 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 which is the person I want to be, moral critique of society and the development in the world, also spiritual reflections. Some, some, in some rare instances, I could also see that people touched upon transcendental experiences and uh, all combined in, in this expression of thick viewing, very much is going on extremely much is going on. And both film scholars and script writers and people in the film business should know that the audience is actually extremely active, extremely full of, of thinking and feelings. And they, they put this, they project this on the screen, filling it with, with meaning, with new meaning. 
which is, could be summarized by idiosyncratic interpretations, p personal interpretations. Mm -hmm. uh, an interesting question maybe could be what part of this complete reaction a screenwriter could control or could anticipate and what part is completely, you know, free yeah. for, for the audience, or for an audience member. Do you have an idea about that? Do you? Yes. Uh, or hypothesis? If you're a skilled storyteller, you, you, you're, you're guiding, you're guiding the, the audience. Uh, but you never know because you have always people in the audience who, who some people, they follow the guidelines. But the, the, there are always people who oppose the guidelines. There, there's a lot of research going on when you have oppositional interpretation and you can never control for that because that's... But when you're a skilled storyteller, you guide and, and it is a match. And that's, that's I, guess, I guess, that is the, 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 magic, the magical trick to, to guide enough mm. to, to let the, the audience fill in. Because when you are, are able to fill in, then you are also engaged. You're invited. It's a generous offer. Here is the story. Please engage. Come aboard. And the thing is, anyway, the film is an object that escapes from the hands of the, its creator anyway at some point. So, and the game is not necessarily to try to make sure uh, we understand what exactly the filmmaker wanted to show or, or prove or uh, indicate. Uh, it, it, what, what is fantastic is when it generates a, a multiplicity of, you know, of different natures of impacts on, on viewers. Yes, that, yeah. The fact that it becomes multi-layered, uh, it, it, it means it's rich. You know. So it seems like it's interesting because it seems like there is a competition in her between yeah. two kinds of needs. One is more to see the film as an object with it entertaining and, and she sees the humor and she enjoys it. And another need is to connect with what does it mean to me and how does it change me? And I think it's interesting to know that films can maybe play on these two levels at the same time. And maybe we cannot control when a viewer go from one need to another, or something like that's, that. That's true. As a screenwriter, maybe we could consider that we are doing, of course, several things. What is you saying, what I can get as a screenwriter from your research right now, at this point, is that I'm building connection and engagement with the film as a form, and maybe if I have irony, yeah. the public can connect to this but deeply, more deeply, if I understand well, there is a personal connection where I am mirroring something yes. uh, from the viewer point of view. So the viewer yeah. built a connection yes. with himself that I cannot control the content of this connection because I don't know the person, no. but I can know that I am doing it. I'm leaving a yeah. space to yeah. that. Yeah. So this is very uh, interesting. What, what was the next step for you after this film, this example? What, what did you get from this example and how did it, did it help you to go further, I would say? The, the, the conclusion is that storytelling and filmmaking are open for rich interpretation and it's a very unpredictable reception interpretation process. So that's actually my, my, my main finding. But if, because there is an interesting uh, continuation from this scene to, because I would like to show the, the, the 10 seconds from Amelie from Amartya and, and the depth. We are completely happy with you continuing to, you know, explain because, the next steps of your yes, of that research. Yes, because um, then you come into to, to, because this, this is an over, uh, overall enjoyment of, of the, this, this film, but a complicated film response is also interesting to, for, for understanding how storytelling works. A lot of people in, in the storytelling uh, scholars, they try to understand these, these rare moments when, when stories work in this immersion, engagement, moving. And we have all been we have experienced this when the, the window is open to, to deep things. And what, what should you call it? Deepening gaze? Gaze is an interesting word when you're slowing down and gazing. Deepening gaze, 
high cognition when you're engaged also in with, with your overall complete understanding of, of the world, which I think is important. Some people don't, they, they dismiss this, that we are engaged with our complete worldview when, when a film takes a grip on us. Higher meaning, feelings of deep meaning, thick interpretation, and a new film scholar, which is uh, uh, Daniel Frampton, could, it's a paradox, affective intelligence. Anyway, I try to, to propose thick viewing, this richness, the, the multi-layered thickness and, th and richness of, of interpretation, which should be very good news for, for story storytellers, that you as a storyteller, you're a creative person, and the viewer is also a creative person. So if you tells the story right, it means things you, will happen. It means you always give more than what you think. Yes. It mean, yeah, it means that because the spectator is an interpretation machine, exactly. it's a machine to generate meaning, of course, a big part of what you do is going to escape, escape from your hands. Exactly. And you're in danger if you end up having viewers considering the film shows, uh, displays ideas which are at the opposite of the spectrum of what you as a filmmaker yes. believe in. That, which happens often. That, that also yeah. happens. Um, so you can call it thick viewing or moments of emotional condensation. That's another way I was playing with that expression. Is that a way to, to put it? The condensation when things are condensed, um, where basic emotions are combined with higher order cognitive processes. One of the, the young women, she was around, she was 29, she picked the Amelie film as her favorite film, which touched her the most. And she picked, in the film, she picked this sequence as the sequence where she was the most emotionally involved. And it happened to be a, a disturbing scene. And she was surprised that, that this scene was so disturbing for her. Uh, anyway, Amelie is, is uh, at home with uh, visiting her father. And they start a conversation. These few seconds is, um, she thinks it's a disastrous communication. And uh, the father asks a question and uh, she, uh, Amelie hopes it's a sincere question, uh, but it's not. He's, a dis he's disappointed and uninterested. And if we go back to, to her interpretation, she talks a lot about these seconds uh, and she sees a woman being afraid. This is Lena, 29, in the same way she's afraid of making a mistake, just like me. I can feel that she seems to be frightened to fail in some way. I don't know if it is guilt or shame. So now in this scene, a door opens to one of the hardest feelings that we have as human beings, guilt and shame. This is very difficult to, 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 to apprehend and to, to carry. Uh, so, so the film taps into these complex uh, feelings deep down. Um, and she's, she's in pain, Lena, when she watched this th scene, she's in pain that there is no contact and, and Lena, during this scene, he, he, she immediately uh, identified the father shutting down. Lena sees how her father is shutting down, and she says, he's not interested. Instead, okay, what's the problem? What do I have to listen to? So she interpreted this, the sighing of the father. <sighs> okay, now Amelie is talking about, again, about something. When she started to say, I feel a change in my life, and, and Lena, understand that as a sincere approach from, from Amelie to talk sincerely with, with the father. But the father dismissed this sincere approach and, okay, what's now? 
And then the next second, Amelie noticed that the father is not interested and she looks down and then back just in half an, of a second and then she gives a, well, I had a, some crack in a, a pregnancy and the father hasn't listened. She gives up. So Lena sees this, she gives up with sarcasm. You can see how she turns away, she turns away her eyes there. No, so, so she sees this just for two seconds. Amelie's disappointment is visible when she is looking down for a second before answering. And then she has this, this beautiful poetic expression of what she sees. It is her eyes that sigh in a way. Her eyes are sighing. It's a of, of disappointment. And she is so touched by this and she feels with, with Amelie and she feels this herself that, that she is so in pain with this constant um, uh, breaking her down in self-confidence uh, exactly like this in, 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 in Amelie. So for her, this is what was one of these rare moments where a disturbing scene was, was picked and we analyzed this in depth. And I guess this is also interesting for script writing because it's not the script, it's the, the, the audiovisual, the, it's the actors and, and how they actually do the, in these small details, how they, they put the faces together and how they are sighing and watching. So this is also the adaptation from, from story to, to screen. Yes, but it's also what we call the subtext of the scene. Absolutely. It's also the intention, the emotional bit of the scene, like the way she reacts, the way I think, I don't, I don't know the script of the film, but I think the, the fact that she looked down, it can be an improvisation, but it can be also in the script that she looks down, Absolutely. because this reaction is key to, believe, to build a connection between the viewer and her emotion. So this for me, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see how much the subtext is a key element in the scene to connect with the viewer. I agree, I agree. So when you have a well-written story, the, the, the surface text and the subtext are, are playing with each other, giving resonance. And an I echo. think we can, as storytellers, we are always trapped or tend be, between explaining the subtext to make it clear, but if we explain it, we kill it, we kill the emotional impact yes, of yes, the subtext, yes. but if we don't explain it, we're taking a risk. So we are yes, trapped between yes. these two priorities of what do I do? Do I explain that she is sad? Of course, it's poor writing if I explain it, but if I don't explain it, will the reader or the producer or a, anybody will understand. So the reaction of her is key in the writing for me, in the scene. This is what is very important here, yeah. the subtext uh, of it. And if it is not explained, which is the case here, uh, if it is not explanatory, it's the moment that the viewer chooses to engage because he feels it's his own intimate connection with the character, mm -hmm. not what he's asked to connect to. Yeah. So exactly. that's really... Exactly. Yeah. And I'm happy I'm not in your shoes to, to, because I'm on the other side. I'm, 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 I'm looking at the, the fantastic results where everything works. <laughs> yes, so it, you, you had an interesting example uh, of uh, another interpretation about Amélie, which gave a completely other you know, yes. door to the yes. film. And, and that was interesting. In, in, two, uh, in some cases, the same person picked the same, uh, different persons picked the same movie. And, and the other woman, uh, she used Amélie as uh, inspiring. Um, she was also 29 um, and she watched it. She wanted to be in that joyous bubble that uh, she says that Amélie creates karma. She helps good people and punish bad people. Um, and she loves the scene where Amelie uh, punished the, the, the merchant with, with the vegetables. Uh, and it's very interesting because, and she loves that the Amelie helps all the people around her. 
and you could call Amelie a messianic character, giving out love for, for others and suffering herself. Um, so she, she was completely absorbed by, by the main character and the love and, and the creativity and, and the beautiful sharing of love that, that Amelie puts up, and which is the main feeling for her in the film. But it's also interesting because <clears throat> when Amelie had, uh, make this mild punishment of, of the merchant, put, knitting the shoes, laces together and mixing the, the morning watch, alarm watch and, and shifting knobs on the door, uh, I asked her, and, and then he, he got his practical joke and he's a little bit punished. And I asked her, is it important that, that Amelie is, is doing this in a very mild way or, or could she punish her, him more? No, it's very important. If she would have punished him harder, she would have become like him. It's important that she's, she's mild in the punishment. Otherwise, it, would be, it wouldn't be nice. It's like in your experiment, experiment with the good prince and the bad prince exactly. you're talking about. And, and I think that is, that is a lesson to, to be learned, that, that when you enter into, when you create a moral universe, you, you should know that you, you, it's really sensitive how you create the satisfactory punishment of the bad, the bad guy. So this character has got a real moral code. Exactly. Yes. Mm. Yes, really. Coherent. Coherent. Not absurd. Yes. Still she punishes people. Yes. Yeah. So it's weird. And, and I am myself as a, I like punishment on, on film. Ah, I, okay. I really enjoy when the bad guy is getting beaten and, mm. and uh, <laughs> too much. So, <laughs> so I myself, I, I really enjoy imagery punishment, but I don't enjoy real life punishment. So it's a funny So would you, would you say that the moral code of a film is a key element to connection or in the hierarchy of elements, uh, what is the, the No, not the of... key. The key is the self-image self negotiation that you can engage with yourself. The moral element is there and, and sometimes it's, it's very explicit, but sometimes it's not explicit if, if I ask the people. But they, generally speaking, people mention this. I feel like the character I can. I can think about the character and about myself. So I think that is the, the general lesson that films are a laboratorium for self-image dreaming and, and negotiations. Actually, that's the main thing. And the next main thing is, is uh, ideas, political, ideological, philosophical ideas about the society, the society mm -hmm. and the self. And sometimes the moral dimension is, is, is absolutely there but not on a general level, I think, if, if I would think about okay. the, the exp ex examples. So if I want to build a universal uh, you know, impact, let's say, and I dream of having everybody connecting to, to my story, <laughs> which is a dream, of course, and maybe, maybe not a necessity, but could be a dream, I rather, I'd rather, in your opinion, think about how people connect with the universal needs or of the character more than the moral code, or is it is it not the case? Yeah, you you could say that. You could say that. That's a, I think it's a nuanced description. So it means that the character description or the character work or characterization work is key yes. in that dimension. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. But you you mainly worked on mainstream uh, films. Yes. Your choice was to study this kind of film. Why did you choose to do this study, uh, mainstream films? I could give a personal answer because I'm, I'm raised with all these kind of, of mainstream films. So, so it's, I'm wired to, to action movies and uh, animations, Disney films, uh, the Jungle Book when I was young and the, the brothers of Marx and, and things like that. Um, so, and I, I've, I have never been into art films. Uh, I don't understand uh, pretentious art film storytelling. I, I don't enjoy it. So it was absolutely a personal uh, choice to, to give voice to mainstream audience, 
mm -hmm. as myself. Mm -hmm. So it was not a, a, a that, that, so that's the deep answer. So I wanted to, because I also had uh, f fantastic experiences of Star Wars movies and when I was young and trying to, so it's a sociological interest of films that attract. What was your experience of uh, Star Wars? <laughs> huge, a huge experience. Can you in interview yourself? <laughs> uh, yes, I was surprised uh, and a little bit embarrassed at the same time, because at the end of the first Star Wars, A New Hope, uh, when, when he made, made the force be with you, when Obi-Wan Kenobi is talking as a transcendental person in his inner voice, I almost cried of, of joy when he managed to, to, he put away the computer and just went flying on, 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 on feeling and he managed to, to bomb the Death Star. And it was the first time in my life that the whole uh, cinema was exploding in applause. I was 17 in, in my hometown, Uppsala. So we were sitting there and when the Death Star exploded, yeah, so everyone was giving a hand. And it's the only example of that. And I was so moved, so I wanted to cry, but I felt embarrassed to cry about this silly uh, ending. But it was a huge impact. And it was also uh, giving me a, a language for something that was important because I never understood the, the words of, of uh, religion, uh, Jesus and Father, then God and then heaven and hell and things like that. But suddenly there, there was a language with a different an audiovisual storytelling which talked about the force, relates uh, the, the ship and the stone and the uh, living creatures. The force, yes, I could relate to that. I, I believe in the, in the force, but I don't believe in God. So, so it was also a deep experience from, from that. A mainstream popular product that creates a symbolic universe that I could actually tap into. So, so that, was, that was a starting point. I didn't know that it was a starting point for my research uh, 20 years later, but it was a starting point for, for my interest in mainstream storytelling. And I think it's interesting to, to understand from a societal point of view, if, if Lord of the Rings or Matrix or, or Star Wars or whatnot is a big success and millions of people are watching these films, you should understand what they think because it tells something about the, the society. Whatever you think about the film, if Dirty Dancing is a, is a hit, if Mamma Mia is a hit, so there is a way to, to people's feelings and thinking about the world indirectly through mm -hmm. big successes. Mm -hmm.